Our next speaker comes to us all the way from Houston, Texas, Roberta Anding. Uh, as you can see in the program, is a registered dietitian to the stars and to the peewees. And you may not have known this, but uh, Roberta had her own radio show in Houston for six years. And uh, so she brings to us a passionate view about nutrition. And so please join me in welcoming Roberta Anding to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Well, howdy. Thank you, that was loud enough, I appreciate that. I'm gonna give you a little whirlwind tour of the role of sports nutrition in taking care of physically active people. And in this role, I need my teammates. I need exercise physiology, I need sports medicine, I need PTs, I need certified athletic trainers, I need strength and conditioning coaches. And so with that as a backdrop, I'm gonna say my career is ultimately about teamwork and hopefully that's the experience you will have as well. We're gonna kind of divide this up a little bit and talk about what are things that are important to athletes, what do they want out of an experience with a sports nutritionist, and then what are your roles? What is your role in terms of providing evidence-based information? Athletes may not know at the beginning how important fluid is, but living in South Texas, in religious heat and humidity, if fluid's not your friend, it will be your enemy if you're underhydrated, so it becomes important to them. I've not ever had an athlete who's not interested in body composition changes. That's translated into body fat loss, lean weight gain, and I want to be bigger, stronger, faster. And how do I do that, and how do I do that safely, and hopefully I can convince them legally. Athletes want a performance edge, and rather than thinking about food, they oftentimes go past food and say, yeah, I, I know about food, but what's the latest supplement out there? So my job is to be that transition, translationalist. I take information that Dr. Kreider finds out in the lab, and then I try and say, okay, here's a way that you can get this done, and here's a product that you might be able to take with, first and foremost, a food-first focus. So what do providers and consumers need to know? First of all, because I take care of children at Texas Children's, I'm the Director of Sports Nutrition at TCH, is there are certainly developmental differences. An eight-year-old is not a 15-year-old, is not a 25-year-old. So there's developmental differences, but if I'm a parent walking in the door, they want their son to look like the next LeBron James, and he's 12. And he's Tanner 1 in terms of his puberty level, which means he's not there yet. But they're looking for, well, does he need growth hormone? Does he need testosterone? And I'm thinking, Dad, he's 12. No, he doesn't need any of that. Let's let maturity get, get up there. And so developmental differences are really pretty key. Body composition is something we all need to talk about versus scale weight. If I'm dealing with an elite athlete, I don't care what they weigh. The only time I'm really concerned about their weight is from a hydration standpoint, how much weight did they lose on the field that day. But body composition rules. So if you're not really good with calipers and that's what you're going to have at your facility, you better learn. I'm very fortunate that I have other ways of assessing body composition. The type of sport, are you aerobically driven or anaerobically driven? Because not only is that nutritionally important, it's oftentimes personality important. Different people gravitate towards those long distance races than people who are willing to come up and slam you upside the head. The intensity of training is unbelievably important. And in an era where a lot of folks don't want to take my ACSM colleagues' recommendations on physical activity, they think they walk around the block and all of a sudden they should have a glass of chocolate milk to recover. You don't need to recover from a low-intensity activity. High-intensity activity, you do need to recover from. Nutritional needs, and we're assuming the adequacy of calories, meaning that first and foremost, if you don't have adequate amounts of calories, if you don't have enough gas in the tank, it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference what the composition is unless you've met the needs of that sport. And then there are certain carbohydrate needs and protein needs, and then also consumers and providers like you want to know about supplements. So if we take a look at the lifespan, and this is what makes my job the best in the world, when I'm looking at children and adolescents, Hydration needs are important, but they also oftentimes have that school challenge. That school challenge is they can't bring a water bottle to their classroom, the water faucet in the hall is broken, and they have difficulty meeting their hydration needs in school. Children are oftentimes concrete thinkers, meaning it's black or it's white. So if you say, please don't drink soda, that's what you get. Because you didn't say sweet tea, 
you didn't say lemonade, you didn't say fruit punch, and you certainly didn't say sports drink. So the reality is you get what you gave them because they're very concrete thinkers. Um, teens are interested in supplements, but I'm going to say that's probably not as, as high as the, the next level is going to be. And puberty allows for muscular hypertrophy. So when folks are in the weight room and they're starting to strength train, you're going to see guys that are 14 that are just not far enough along. So they're going to get stronger, they're just not going to get bigger until they get a little bit further along that pubertal scale, and that's oftentimes frustrating. Some of the science is going to suggest those are the individuals that are much more likely to dabble in anabolic steroids because they want to look like the guy who's more physically mature. So we've got those issues as well. College and professional, they have a lot more flexibility in terms of meeting fluid needs. Hopefully, you get the development of abstract thinking, although sometimes I'll have players say to me, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. They don't want the science, they don't want the fluff. It's give me the black or white. Supplements become the norm. And so part of my role is I'm the supplement expert, theoretically, at the Houston Texans and the Houston Astros. So they're all sent to me first. So I have to know not only the science, I have to know the safety. Bodies are fully developed, and they have the ability to gain strength and have muscular hypertrophy. Well, certainly, um, because I'm in partnership with the ACSM, their position paper on fluid replacement is the gold standard for me. So we actually have that urine color chart that was um, developed years ago in, over urinals in all of the facilities, because I can talk about the color of your urine, but my job is to make sure the athlete knows about that, and so when they get up and go, it's sitting right in front of them. So I've had players say to me, well, you know, if you want me in the three to four range, do you got anything darker than an eight? Because I'm a little bit darker than an eight. I got kind of this mortar oil urine going on here, and I think, well, I think I need to send you to sports medicine. Little concern there about rhabdomyolysis. And we actually dip urines. And so if you think my job is glamorous, you can just imagine me in the training room Giving, taking urine samples and making sure that I've tried to get them with a urine-specific gravity of about 1.020. And as a dietitian, it's not just about what you drink, it's also about the fuel that you put in your body. So if I have an athlete who's chronically dry, I might want to give them higher water vol volume foods. Are they having soups on their menu? Are they having milk? Are they having yogurt? How many servings of fruits and vegetables do they take in in order to get that hydration? This is my bod pod, and I love this equipment. I should actually probably be a rep for this company because I think it's awesome. Um, we certainly use this on a regular basis in terms of assessing body composition. Here are two examples. This is Seth Payne, who played for us um, about 2004, 2005. Six foot four, 305 pounds, 37 BMI, and percent body fat in the bod pod was 19%. At that point in time, he was one of the leanest linemen in the NFL. That's really lean for a lineman. Uh, I can also now contrast him to Corey Bradford, who was our wide receiver. Body weight is 196 pounds, percent body fat is 5.2, lean weight is 186. So clearly both of these men are very positionally appropriate defensive linemen as well as a, a wide receiver, but this is going to make a difference. I have a girl at Rice who's a, a, a sprinter, came to see me five foot six, 165 pounds, and she said, I'm fat. Put her in the bod pod, she was 9% and eumenorrheic. So I said, go home and kiss your parents because you're genetically gifted. What type of athlete are you working with, aerobic versus anaerobic athletes? And certainly, for many of you, that's very self-explanatory. The IOC, the International Olympic Committee, came out with their consensus paper on nutrition and sport, and they graded carbohydrate recommendations based on intensity. So if you're that low-intensity, skill-based athlete with a large muscle mass, think lineman, three to five grams per kilogram of body weight may be a good place to start. Certainly when you get to that extreme commitment, you can be up to 8 to 12 grams of carbohydrate per day, and that's going to make a difference in the long run. So what sports are anaerobically driven? These are my two anaerobic athletes, so clearly they inherited that, that body type from their daddy. And what are those sports? Well, certainly those are going to be the sports that have a resistance training component. So I consider the people that are the 400 meter, the 800 meter basketball players stop and go sports more my anaerobic. Resistance training and muscle hypertrophy. So when I say people get bigger, stronger, faster, I'm the food portion of this. I'm not the strength conditioning portion of this. So being in my role with adolescents, the Tanner staging makes all the difference in the world. You are considered physically mature when you're a Tanner 5, 
And so certainly this is going to be something that I'm going to get from the sports medicine docs that I work with at Texas Children's. One of the barriers I get is women say, I don't want to look like guys. And I said, if you don't, aren't injecting testosterone, that's probably not terribly likely. You can get bigger and stronger, but you're not going to get bulky. Eccentric exercise, and certainly in a very time-effective manner, eccentric exercise in my facilities tends to give us better gains than doing mostly a dominant concentric work. And certainly time under load, how much time someone's spending lifting and lowering a weight is important. And what we see at Texas Children's, about 40% of the injuries my docs are seeing are people who are coming from the weight room because they just don't know what they're doing. And so we spend a lot of time talking about that. We all know that protein is going to help in terms of muscular development and making more muscle fibers, more muscle tissue. And we can look at the science and say that the protein requirements for strength trained athletes are no greater than two grams of protein per kg. A couple studies saying bodybuilders may benefit from a little bit more. But when we get that down to the nitty gritty and you ask college athletes, what's the protein requirement? 67% said they didn't know. They didn't know. 33% estimated the requirement at 8.7 grams per kg. Clearly, we don't want people over consuming at that level, but it's the job of the sports dietitian to say, let me show you what that means on your plate. Let me help you to get to that. In teaching at Rice, I asked the question, where does whey protein come from? And I get the health food store, I get the health food store, but boy, you better get NSF certified product or otherwise you're gonna have a positive drug test. And when I say it comes from milk, it's like, really? It comes from milk, this is milk? I said, yes, there's whey and casein protein in milk, and milk really is actually a food-based version. So I think we've got a lot of work to do. The science is there and the science is solid, but the question becomes, what do you put on your plate? Intensity determines nutritional need. So if I have someone that, is coming to me saying, I can't gain any muscle mass, my first job is to go knock on the strength coach's door and say, how hard of a worker is this person? And if they say, not very hard, they're dropping the weights, they wait till I turn around and they, they stop lifting, adding more protein isn't going to give that athlete the desired result because the intensity is not there to generate lean mass gains. Now when we get into the, the tradition of sports nutrition, Tradition, coaches, religious and cultural beliefs influence nutrition choices. When we're talking about parents and littler kids, parents are oftentimes the ones that are providing nutrition information to their teams. So I've had a dad say to me, well, I can't believe you're not recommending the paleo diet. Why aren't you recommending the paleo diet to my son who's a distance runner because I don't want him to get fat. So here's where, this is my message, is everybody eats so everybody's an expert, but nutrition is more than an opinion, it is a science. And so unless we really elevate it to the science level, we're always gonna be fighting these battles. Supplements may prove useful, but unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, depending on your perspective, the NCAA, the NFL, and Major League Baseball regulate what can be provided. The only product that is available in an NFL facility is Gatorade. Period, done. We can't provide a multivitamin. We can't provide any of the evidence-based supplements because the league is saying, guess what? We're tired of having players have positive drug tests, so here's our solution. Our solution is we're limiting access. So now I've got players who will go out and pick their own product from vitamin shop or wherever they're going and oftentimes don't get there. Are dietary supplements needed? The science is clear that when things work, they work. These professional organizations have policies in place. NSF certified for sport or informed choice are verification um, agencies that will actually test product and make sure that they don't have any banned substance. In fact, if you have your cell phone, get those apps, NSF certified for sport, you can get on your app. But just because it's certified doesn't mean it works. So just because something's clean, safe, and legal and you're not gonna have a positive drug test doesn't mean it works. The great news is for me, Food is 100% legal. I don't have to worry about someone having a positive drug test from eating spaghetti. So the nice thing for me is teaching this as a food first philosophy really helps athletes to perform better on the field, helps them to recover better, it helps them to protect their immune system, and we get exactly what we're looking for. So thank you all very much.
Great job, Roberta. Thank you. And you can tell it's very popular. I think I've gotten 25 questions for you, but we're not going to answer them all. Now, stay with us because we will tell you a solution at the end of the, of the program today about how you can get all your questions answered. So if your question is not called out, don't despair. We're coming to you. Uh, the first one's from Andrew K. Have you seen a difference in athletes, possibly gluten intolerant, who consume their carbohydrates from grains versus other sources such as fruits and vegetables? Uh, certainly, I do think there are, there are athletes that not only have true overt celiac disease, but may have gluten sensitivity. And to me, it's listening to that athlete, listening to their signs and symptoms. The challenge is we can keep their calorie needs up with other gluten-free options like potatoes and rice and other things that, are, that don't have gluten. Fruits and vegetables would be a tough way to get it because the calories are relatively low. So I'd have to go with something a little bit more energy dense. But yes, I'm seeing uh, an increase in athletes who want to reduce gluten in their diet. It's always changing a little bit, isn't it? Always changing. Yeah. Uh, and this is Joe A. from James Madison. Uh, any, this is always a good way to get your question read. Howdy, Roberta. Your presentation was fantastic. How common is the underappreciation of proper carbohydrate replenishment for anaerobic athletes when compared to protein? And how do, we, how do you suggest we change this phenomenon? I think that's actually a really good point because when you look at the need to replace glycogen stores, it's oftentimes not their event that gets them. My son ran the 400. If you're good, you're running under 46 seconds. The energy need isn't there isn't great. It's training that gets you. It's the two hours on the track. And so I think that's a real challenge for all of us because what we're doing is we're fighting popular um, press. We're fighting paleo, we're fighting Atkins, we're fighting all these low carbohydrate diets. I think what oftentimes is the big turning point for an individual athlete is they find out that they do better, they recover quicker, their next practice is infinitely better because they've replaced the carbohydrate. But I think that's a real challenge. And again, nutrition is a science and not an opinion, so we need more nutrition scientists out there preaching the good word. That's always a good message. It isn't is. It? it is. Oh, and, and along that same line, this question comes from Brian L. What are your views on types of sports drinks marketed to aid recovery, such as Gatorade Recovery versus natural drinks like chocolate milk? I'm not sure nat chocolate milk is a natural drink. Yeah. So <laughs> I was on a farm for many years and we never had any chocolate milk cows. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, th I, I think in that instance, a lot of it depends on me is who is the athlete. And there are a lot of nice commercial beverages that can be used for recovery that have whey protein, that have all the vitamins and minerals. The problem I have is more of an ethical one. I deal with a lot of inner city kids that will spend a disproportionate amount of money on product that they really could have gotten with real food. And so to me, yes, there's some great products out there, Gatorade Recover, Muscle Milk, some of the other products that are out there. My favorite one, quite honestly, and I can answer this for most of you all afterwards, is uh, a product with HMB. It's called Insure Muscle Health. I actually think it's a really good product. But the cost of those is oftentimes my limiting factor in terms of recommending them mm -hmm. because I don't... I want people to put real food on the table and not products that are really pretty expensive. Yeah, and this is this last question it was really kind of very interesting. And I hadn't thought about it this way yet. From Lucio V, um, howdy from Texas A&M San Antonio. Working with professional athletes, I'm sure you deal with physically fit athletes all the time. Do you also see obesity within the professional ranks? Uh, obesity within the professional ranks as evidenced by bod pod. Mm -hmm. And so I look at body composition mm -hmm. as position specific. Mm -hmm. I don't want a lineman at 5% body fat because they're not going to be able to do their job. One of the things I'm most proud of, because of this relates to obesity, is both at Rice University, where I'm the sports dietitian there, and the Houston Texans, and we'll get it going with the Astros, is when players retire, we have a transition from football program. And so we really focus in on getting their percent body fat down because they're no longer professional athletes. They don't need to sit at 30% body fat any longer. And so we really make that transition. Overfat athletes at the professional rank exist, but I have to tell you, they don't last for very long. <laughs> they don't last for very long yeah. because they're competing against people that are leaner. How many of those transition programs are out there? That That's seems a great like a, question. A great service. I don't know. I know um, a couple college dietitians are doing that, Jen Ketterly at Georgia. Other people are doing that nationally to help those athletes who are not moving on to the next level protect their health because, again, that's what dietitians do. Yeah. Thank you, Roberta. Thank Super you. presentation. Thank you. Thank you.